Good afternoon, uh, my name is Nathan Schimpf and I will be presenting to you today on the use of statistical inferencing for artificial intelligence. Um, just a quick overview before we get too much further in. Um, I wanted to highlight the purpose and then give a bit of foundations both in statistics and then kind of specifically discussing Bayesian networks. Um, going from there we'll actually talk about the three techniques um, or classes of techniques that I thought would be most uh, relevant. Um, they're kind of the, the greatest hits, so to speak, of statistical inferencing. So uh, finally, after that, we will look at current research, um, which would just be a couple of papers that use some of these techniques um, to solve different problems. So what's the importance of inferencing? In short, managing uncertainty. Uh, we've talked about task environments in the past, about how they can be non-deterministic, um, this is probably the most obvious way that inferencing is helpful. Um, when the environment is changing in ways that we don't necessarily have direct control over, it might be helpful to predict what changes are more likely than others to help for um, kind of allocating the time that an agent might spend developing its contingencies. The other aspect to this is if the task environment is partially observable, meaning again that the agent isn't able to uh, perceive the complete environment, um, but only maybe a certain portion of it. Um, this might be a way that it can anticipate what um, what the rest of the environment looks like. Uh, that might help to limit the belief state and again reduce the amount of time spent planning or spend more time planning for, I guess, more optimal solutions. Looking into statistics first, um, as kind of a review, um, if you have not taken any statistics class before, the main thing we, that you need to understand going from this is the probability distribution function, or PDF. Um, in short, this is going to tell you the likelihood between zero and one um, that one specific event occurs. Um, in this case, we're looking at a normal distribution uh, let me see if I can, we're looking at a normal distribution here um, with, you know, some event that is a real number um, x, given the certain parameters um, of the, the distribution's mean and variance, um, and then this is the actual function that defines how that maps into a probability. We're looking at normal distributions because they are extremely popular for statistics. Um, this is for a couple of reasons. In statistics, uh, normal distributions are considered um, very commonly seen in observations and in nature, um, but also they are very easy to estimate. Um, one of the key reasons for that, um, you see mentioning the best estimators for the mean and variance, mu and sigma squared, are actually the sample mean and sample variance. It's a very convenient um, uh, property of normal distributions. Now, the sample mean and sample variance are what we call statistics, uh, meaning that it's something you can calculate or estimate from a set of observations. So if you were given 20 samples from a normal distribution, you could calculate the average of those 20 samples. That would be your sample mean. That would be your best estimator of the actual mean. Uh, you could calculate the sample variance, which I'm not going to go through the equations here. Um, there's uh, two other points about statistics um, that aren't very important to understand um, unless you're taking a more in-depth course on the topic, um, but that would be sufficiency and completeness. Basically, a sufficient statistic is one that um, contains all the information you need to know to accurately represent one specific parameter from that distribution. Complete statistics um, is a bit more of a complicated uh, definition or theme. Um, the concept more officially is that any function of, um, the expectation of any function of your parameter is going to equal zero, which really is just describing that your parameter is distinct in some way within that distribution. The last key thing about statistics to mention is this concept of parametric models. 
I mention that because a lot of inferencing that we'll be talking about um, deals with parametric models, meaning that it follows a specific equation, like with the normal distribution, and that it has a specific finite number of parameters, in this case, two. Um, there's, of course, plenty of other distributions and families um, that can crop up, but um, the main point, again, is that it's a finite number of parameters. Um, it's fairly easy to deterministically calculate. As far as foundations with Bayesian networks go, um, I, I more so just want to introduce this concept to you. Um, this is uh, a main application for inferencing um, that we see time and again. So first of all, Bayes rule, if you don't know, uh, it is listed up here um, and it basically describes the event that the probability, excuse me, that some event A occurs given a condition B. Um, it's listed over here as being, you know, the probability of that event B occurring um, multiplied by the, you know, it's a, a joint um, probability between B and A divided by the actual probability of just B. Um, there's the concept with Bayesian networks is to try and help relate that equation, and especially as it gets more complicated once you, once you introduce the actual distributions to being those probabilities, um, trying to relate those in a more human intuitive way um, with some sort of graph. Uh, you can see that on the right, this example is actually pulled from Wikipedia. Um, and basically, the, the idea is that you have these nodes, um, you know, rain, sprinkler, whether or not the grass is wet, that kind of thing. Um, and those nodes represent some sort of, um, any sort of value. It could be a parameter, a hypothesis, a random variable, whatever. But it has to be something that you can represent with a probability function. The edges tell you that there's some sort of condition or some sort of dependence between those two nodes. Um, and this modeling system, from that, you can actually use it for a wide variety of things. Um, hidden variable inferencing. So say that we can observe whether or not the grass is wet, but we aren't able to observe whether or not it's raining. We can actually use this network or this graph to kind of back propagate through the calculations and estimate from that what the probability is of you know, it raining based on just what we're able to see. Uh, parameter learning, so we have all these connections laid out. How can we determine what the parameters are for these distributions? And then structure learning. If it's a very complicated um, network, which is not the case obviously for this one, um, it might be difficult to determine what connections there are between one node and another. Um, in machine learning, it's not unheard of to actually just pass in the list of nodes and instead kind of expect um, that the algorithm will determine where a conditionality sort of relationship occurs and then also estimate the parameters. The first technique I want to discuss with you for how to actually kind of solve some of these um, distributions and estimating these parameters is maximum likelihood estimation. It belongs to, it's kind of a subset of a subset of estimation types. The broadest form is Bayesian learning, um, and all of those deal with some sort of joint distribution that you see at the top. Um, the idea being that you can estimate the, the um, well for Bayesian learning, this would be a hypothesis rather than a parameter, but um, you can estimate some sort of um, event given your data um, by just kind of multiplying together the available data observations you have. Um, for maximum likelihood estimation, this would be estimating a specific parameter by, again, taking the joint product or joint distribution of all your observations. Um, this is a fairly simple, um, almost intuitive approach, but it's very limited. Um, so first of all, you have to have IID or independently identically distributed observations. This basically means that they're all, um, each observation you have um, is not related to one another other than that they are from the same distribution function. 
It has to be for a parametric distribution. Again, limited number of parameters, uh, something that you can actually compute, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, and the data has to be complete, meaning that it represents the, well, the complete set of parameters. You can um, understand the complete, uh, the, the total distribution function from the observations you have. The more general case for this is uh, maximum a posteriori. Um, so Bayesian learning, and then under that would be a posteriori, and then under that is maximum likelihood. Um, a posteriori takes this idea of generating a likelihood function um, based on the parameters, but it actually assigns um, or requires you to assign um, some sort of initial assumption around which parameters are more likely before you even pass in the first observation. Um, maximum likelihood estimation is, you know, if, as long as the function is tractable, as long as it's solvable, um, this is one of the optimal solutions that you can get. Um, if the environment can be modeled by a standard distribution or a standard family of distributions, then maximum likelihood estimation can estimate that set of parameters effectively. Here's an example. Uh, I've talked a lot about concepts, and I'm sure at least some sort of numbers might help here. Um, so uh, the textbook that we've been using a lot um, included this example in it. Um, basically, the idea is that you have a bag of candies, and you're trying to estimate how likely it is that you'll pull um, or what the probability of pulling a cherry candy is versus any other type. Knowing that, um, the probability we're going to assume that parameter, the probability of pulling cherry, is theta. Uh, therefore, the, the probability of pulling anything else is just going to be 1 minus theta. We can create this joint distribution or this likelihood function um, by kind of taking those values and multiplying through the, all, the total set of observations that we have in. And what we end up with is right, uh, right here, excuse me. Uh, so C being the number of cherry candies and L being the number of candies that are not cherry. From here, it's actually a calculus problem. So um, taking the natural logarithm is a step that helps to simplify the function. Um, we know that we can still find a local maximum um, at the same points if we're taking the log of a function as when we take the function itself. So this allows for easier differentiation. So we take the derivative with respect to theta, set that equal to zero, and we can solve for our maximum likelihood estimate of theta. Uh, in this case, it's a fairly intuitive answer, the number of cherries that you've pulled so far versus the total number of candies that you've pulled. Um, what these results tell us is that this is a really simple framework, a very kind of easy way to find answers for more complex functions, but it is still very limited. Um, this can only be done, uh, first of all, if, again, it's a parametric model. Um, if this isn't something that you can model with a set number of parameters and functions, obviously you can't write it up and take a derivative of it then. Um, the other point is that it's not very useful if you have a small number of observations. Um, let's take a look over here at the graph shown for actually the more general case, maximum a posteriori. Um, and what you can see is that the probabilities aren't really clear until you're about, you know, six candies in um, to understand really which parameter is most likely. Um, as an aside, we know that this is a posteriori and not maximum likelihood because looking at observation zero, we see that they're actually at different points. That means that they had to have been assigned some sort of probability beforehand. All right, so what do we do when it's not a parametric model? I've mentioned that several times, and I'm sure it's interesting to some of you because you know, data doesn't always fit a nice, easy function. Uh, the textbook mentioned two techniques that are very popular, both under the family of density estimation. So um, again, the goal is to model it without any sort of assumption about the data. Um, and the two approaches that are mentioned are k-nearest neighbors and kernel functions. 
k-nearest neighbors, um, you're probably familiar with it from clustering. Basically, the idea is that given one specific point, you want to find, um, well, the k-nearest points to that point. Uh, you can see that up in the top um, figure. Uh, the idea is, you know, they might have a point out here, um, and you end up with this very large distance trying to collect all of those um, k closest points. Um, what that actually correlates to is the density at that point itself. So the idea with using k-nearest neighbors is that you can estimate the density by um, trying to collect points nearby. Um, obviously, when your total radius is much smaller, you have a much more likely chance of pulling a value from that um, portion of the distribution. The second technique is kernel functions. Um, this would basically mean that every point in your data, so every observation that you have, is treated as its own Gaussian function, or its own normal distribution. Um, from there, you know, you have your mean, and then the goal is to set a global variance value, which is referred to as the window size, um, such that that kind of um, meets a balance between overfitting to the data and overgeneralizing. And we can see that both with um, kernel functions and k nearest neighbors. Um, with k and n at the top, uh, we can see, you know, selecting too small of a k value can can yield this overfitting. Um, if we get too large of a k value, then it's a very generalized format. And the same process happens if we have too small of a variance or too large of a variance. The last technique I want to discuss with you is uh, the concept of expectation maximization. This is often just referred to as the EM algorithm. Um, and this is uh, another approach that requires parametric models. However, it deals with uh, some situations that we haven't seen yet, namely when the data is not complete or when you're dealing with variables that aren't directly observable. The general approach for this algorithm is in two steps, um, the so-called E step, which is trying to fill in for either incomplete data or your hidden variable um, by computing the expectations or the different moments of probability given your, you know, your likelihood function and um, some other information, of course. Once you've kind of filled in that data, you can actually go through and compute the parameter values. Um, this is effectively just using maximum likelihood estimation um, to compute those parameters. And once you do that, you kind of just iterate between these two um, for however many steps it takes to converge towards a useful model. Um, this approach is widely used in statistics um, for a couple of different applications. First of all, clustering. It's an alternative to k-nearest neighbors, uh, believe it or not, um, for a couple of different reasons. Uh, it's mainly used for actually learning Bayesian networks or hidden Markov models. Again, being able to learn those parameters or those relationships between variables, um, it's very capable at doing that, especially, again, because it, it, it's designed to, right? Um, the final aspect is estimating for missing data, um, again, as we've kind of mentioned. So an example that I wanted to discuss is uh, from Computer Age Statistical Inference. It's another te textbook um, that will be mentioned towards the end. Uh, this example basically deals with a two-dimensional normal distribution. Uh, you have all of 40 samples available. Um, however, along one dimension, half of those samples are missing their, their actual data. Because of that, you can't just use maximum likelihood estimation. Um, because, you know, of course, if you're missing half the data for one of those dimensions, then you, you can't formulate a useful um, estimation. The procedure here, again, um, there, there's this initial step of trying to do um, an MLE estimation for your sets of parameters along a 2D distribution, those being the means and variances for each distribution, as well as the covariance between the two. Um, once you do that, you can actually estimate your missing values here. 
using um, the, the equation that's listed. Um, this is basically the derived as the expectation for those for that dimension. Uh, once you do that, you can kind of go back through, recompute the MLE for each of these parameters, and iterate between the two. Uh, I implemented this in Python um, with 50 samples instead, uh, 25 missing, um, just to kind of keep with that half and half. Um, you see the parameters that were chosen uh, listed at the top, and actually what it converged towards um, over 20 steps at the bottom with these little hat accents. Um, so with that being said, you can kind of see in this animation how it doesn't exactly or perfectly model the data. Uh, obviously, it can't capture the exact positioning and noise, um, but it is able to approximate that and give you a better understanding of the relationship. Um, at the very least, a better understanding of those parameters or a better estimation of those parameters. So the first paper I wanted to discuss, um, as far as research goes, is using maximum likelihood estimation. Uh, the technique here um, was used for trying to find the location of a, of a device in home um, using wireless signals. So with smart home environments, a uh, common approach for kind of uh, localizing or positioning an object is by measuring the received signal strength and kind of detecting how much that strength has decayed, which is related in some degree to distance. Um, doing this um, is kind of done with a couple of steps. This paper talked about how in the past, maximum likelihood estimation alone has been used, um, but isn't perfectly accurate. And it proposes using a couple of different weighting techniques um, between the different observation points um, you know, if there's sensors scattered throughout a house, so to speak, um, to better estimate the position. So you can see the results in these three different scatter plots um, using a constant weight, so every node is valued equally, using one where nodes further away are valued less um, by a linear relationship and then by an exponential relationship. Uh, this exponential relationship of 1 over d squared actually provided the best results um, for localizing a uh, device. The second paper to discuss um, deals with crowd sensing, specifically an issue um, known as compressed sensing. Um, this is a common topic within big data and especially with IoT um, scenarios uh, where it's not practical to store all of the data coming in and it's more important or more significant to only store and transmit and communicate data that's considered more meaningful. Often what this means is that measurements are taken from one specific location at one time um, but then you know several seconds later it's being pulled from a different location which makes it very hard to go back through and reconstruct your original model or your original data. Uh, this paper proposed using KNN clustering um, to do that reconstruction and that estimation. Um, however, it developed a different um, distance measure than just you know your physical distance between two points. It also incorporated um, the the distance in time, so the number of seconds um, between each measurement as well, and set a kind of a learned constant. Um, that would kind of provide a distance or a ratio of the two. Um, and what this shows is that that provided the best error out of the three techniques they tested, where it's just clustering by just space, just time, or the combination of the two. The final paper I wanted to discuss is um, dealt with something called blind source separation. So there might be um, this is treated as an audio um, problem, however, it's often seen also with wireless signals. Um, the basic idea is that you have one desired signal um, that you're trying to recover, but a variety of interfering signals um, that are also coming in to all of your sensing devices. 
uh, in this case microphones. Um, previous papers have discussed how this can be solved using, um, for example, uh, linear algebra techniques like matrix decomposition, um, but there's some limitations to that, uh, limitations that this actually overcomes. So the technique used here um, is kind of outlined in this flow graph. It performs a clustering of the data. Well, first of all, it takes everything into the, the frequency domain and then clusters the samples um, based on that, those parameters, uh, frequency, amplitude, uh, et cetera. From that, um, it tries to generate a set of parameters to model each of these clusters. Um, that modeling is done using the EM algorithm um, and those parameters are then compared against some amount of known knowledge beforehand, um, which allows for masking the data to just provide your desired signals. Uh, from there, it just can be converted back to the time domain. The results were very impressive. Um, first of all, it was able to recover um, the original signal with interference and reverberation, reverberation being when a uh, signal kind of um, remains present over a period of time. Uh, it kind of decays for a much longer period of time and stays within the sensor. Um, the other aspect is that it was able to recover the signal when there were more sources of noise than there were microphones, um, which is something that you know matrix decomposition can't do necessarily. And you can see in this bottom right a plot um, comparing some of the different uh, masking techniques that they used. Um, however, overall it performed, um, you know, uh, laudably. Uh, that is all I have for you. Um, here are my references if you would like to go through any of them. Uh, first of all, there is a, a little GitHub article someone had posted. I found it very useful for um, better understanding the difference between maximum likelihood estimation and uh, maximum a posteriori estimation. Uh, it provided just some better intuitions than our textbook did. Um, a Wikipedia article on Bayesian networks. This actually provides a lot of information on statistical inferencing in general and is a very good example if you want to go through and uh, maybe develop a more in-depth understanding of how you might backpropagate through a network um, to estimate hidden variables. Finally, of course, um, there's a couple of textbooks. Um, our AI and our artificial intelligence um, textbook, as well as um, computer age statistical inference. Uh, this covers a couple of different techniques that are very popular, um, both dealing with statistics as well as machine learning and even deep learning. Uh, finally, the three different articles uh, that we briefly discussed in terms of how these techniques have come up in more recent years. Uh, so again, that is all I have. If you have any questions at all, I would be glad to answer them over email. Uh, apologies for taking, um, you know, running over time, but I hope uh, you found this information uh, useful.